excuse me, I'm just going to record this. Um, and tonight, we are very, very fortunate to have speaking for us, Katie Fallon. And our program is titled Vulture, the Private Life of an Unloved Bird. We're still having people join. Sorry, folks. Um, vultures are often overlooked, underappreciated, and unloved, despite the vital role they play in healthy ecosystems. Worldwide, vultures are more likely to be threatened or endangered than any other group of raptor. But in the United States, turkey and black vultures may be increasing in number. Our guest speaker, Katie Fallon, will discuss the life and times of the noble turkey vulture, including its feeding, nesting, and roosting habits, migratory behaviors, and common misperceptions. Fallon is author of Vulture, The Private Life of an Unloved Bird. She's also written Cerulean Blues, A Personal Search for a Vanishing Songbird, as well as two books for children. She's a founder of the Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia, a nonprofit organization dedicated to conserving the region's wild birds. And she served as president of the Mountaineer chapter of the National Audubon Society. A member of the International Association of Avian Trainers and Educators, Katie has worked with birds since 1998. Over the last 20 years, she's given educational presentations featuring live raptors, vultures, parrots, and corvids. She's also a columnist for Bird Watchers Digest and has taught writing at West Virginia University, Virginia Tech, and elsewhere. Her first word was bird. For more information, visit her website at katiefallon.com. We're so honored and grateful that she's agreed to talk with us tonight. Welcome, Katie. Hello, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much everybody for um, having me speak to your club. I'm excited to be younger. It's sort of too bad that we can't be together, you know, in real life, <laughs> giving giving a, the presentation. But hopefully, you'll be able to get back to that um, somewhat soon. Uh, I should mention that um, I have some young children and dogs in my house, so at any moment they could sort of like burst into the room where I'm sitting. <laughs> but uh, I don't think that they I don't think that they'll do that. So, but apologies in advance if that happens. But that will that will just make it more charming, right? So, so I'm going to go ahead and start to share my presentation. Um, and if anybody, yes, if anybody has questions and you want to type them in the chat, we can um, answer them at the end. Uh, um, all right, and I'm going to go ahead and start to share my screen. And I'm going to get rid of, not everybody, I'm going to get rid of some of these little faces on the side. All right, there we go. So sometimes um, I've been giving these presentations uh, pretty regularly on Zoom. And it's always a little kind of unnerving when I just like laugh at my own jokes. And I don't know if anybody out in the, I don't know if anybody watching is laughing or, or asleep or whatever. So I'll, I just kind of, it's just sort of a weird, if you've given presentations on Zoom, it's different from interacting with the real, you know, people in real life. So ah, sorry if I laugh at myself sometimes. I'll just imagine you all laughing too. So uh, the title of my presentation is Vulture, the Private Life of an Unloved Bird. Um, although uh, vultures are not unloved by everybody, um, they actually have quite a few fans. Um, this particular picture was taken at a vulture festival at Boyce Thompson Arboretum State Park um, in Arizona. If any of you have ever been there birding, it's a really great place to go. Um, it's about an hour from Phoenix. And they have two vulture festivals every year. Uh, they have the um, uh, Welcome Back Buzzards Festival and the Bye Bye Buzzards Festival. And I've been to both of them, of course. Um, and this is from the uh, Welcome Back Buzzards Festival. Uh, kind of an interesting side note is that 
Uh, we often vulture and buzzard sort of get used interchangeably here in the US, but um, a buzzard uh, is officially a um, hawk in the Buteo family. Uh, but so in the, in the, in the UK, uh, in Europe, a red-tailed hawk, they would call it a red-tailed buzzard. So, and there are, are lots of, uh, lots of old world buzzards, honey buzzards, auger buzzards, and they're all hawks in the Buteo family. Um, and the idea is when people, or why we think we call vultures buzzards in North America, um, when people from Europe came here and saw these big dark birds in the sky, they maybe called them buzzards, which is what they would have been um, in, the, uh, in the old world. Uh, but here, but they're not officially buzzards, even though we, we call them that. Um, anyway, other, other possible subtitles for my book were Vulture, um, Eat Your Heart Out. Uh, and um, Vulture, um, happy entrails to you, <laughs> but, uh, but we didn't go with any of those. <laughs> um, so I also wrote uh, a book about these birds. And the, this presentation is based on the book. It used to have a different looking cover. It used to have this, a purple cover, um, but it was, it was republished with a new publisher um, in the fall of 2020. And it has a, the text is mostly the same, but it's got color photos now and a nice color picture. So if you're a person who likes color photos, uh, the new version is um, is probably the one that you would you would you would prefer. Um, and this particular vulture uh, is one that um, she didn't quite make it into the book, but I have a few of her pictures in the presentation. Um, and my shirt says "Warning: This person uh, may talk about vultures at any moment." Uh, and this this vulture is a female bird named Boris, and she was shot and can't return to the wild. Um, because she can't fly well enough. Um, and she is an educational ambassador who lives at the Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia, uh, which is the organization that I work with that you'll hear me talk about um, pretty often tonight. We usually just say ACCA because Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia is kind of a mouthful. So, so Boris is one of our um, education ambassadors at ACCA. So, but before we get to that stuff, we have to talk about um, the big picture uh, the big picture of vultures. So this is the only, uh, these slides in the beginning have a lot of words, but don't be alarmed. They, um, most of the slides do not have many words. So there are 23 species of vulture worldwide, um, 16 in Africa, Asia, and Europe, so the old world, and seven in North and South America. And it's not believed that they are very closely related to each other. Um, they, vultures in the old world and the new world tend to look fairly similar. However, uh, and they tend to have similar jobs in the ecosystem. Um, however, they, they are not probably not closely related. Uh, old world vultures are likely more closely related to uh, eagles um, and hawks and new world vultures are, it's a little bit more uh, mysterious um, who they are related to. They were traditionally with raptors and then they uh, moved them to storks in I think the 1990s. Um, there was a belief that they maybe shared a, a common ancestor with storks but then uh, about I believe about 10 years ago they moved them back to raptors in, in sort of a slightly different taxonomic place though. Um, but uh, whatever the case, they are not, old world and new world vultures are not um, closely related to each other, but they share a lot of similarities. Um, 11 of those 16 African and Eurasian vultures are endangered and eight are considered critically endangered. Here in the new world, uh, we have just one critically endangered vulture, um, the California condor. Uh, and some of our, several of our um, new world vultures are, um, are doing pretty well, like the um, black and turkey vultures that we have, um, that we have here, uh, here in North America. Threats to vultures worldwide are similar. Um, they include poisoning, electrocution. Um, poisoning though can change depending on where you are in the world. Uh, some parts of the world, um, vultures, um, are poisoned by uh, carcasses that may be laced with poison, not quite, not maybe not intended for vultures, but maybe intended for um, other other species like 
um, lions or or uh, feral dogs or something that might uh, harm some uh, herds, some cattle. And then the vultures are kind of, you know, come of course and feed on the carcass and then are kind of the unintended um, victims of that poisoning. Sometimes carcasses uh, in places like Africa are, are poisoned our poached carcasses are poisoned with the intention of harming vultures and other scavenging birds that may gather in the sky above a carcass and alert authorities to its location. Uh, lead poisoning is something we'll talk about for a couple minutes, but that's also a problem for a lot of large, a lot of large and small scavenging birds, not just vultures, but it's a problem for vultures too. Um, electrocution. Uh, can occur when a large large birds fly into power lines. This is a problem in some parts of the world for vultures, and there are some some vultures are persecuted due to sort of belief based reasons. Uh, an example of this um, in southern Africa, there's kind of a black market on vulture parts, especially vulture heads. There's a belief that if you uh, smoke uh, vulture vulture um, brains. Um, or have the head of a vulture around that you might sort of get this second sight or this ability to predict the future. Uh, just like the vultures can seem to appear above a carcass um, without any, you know, without any, uh, like as if they have foresight. I don't know if that's true. I haven't tried that, but it's prob probably not. So I should mention that these really nice vulture photos um, are not ones that I have taken, but I would love to go to Africa and see a lappet faced vulture. This is one of the really big old world species. Here in North America, we used to have larger vulture species, um, physically bigger sized vultures than we have now. Um, the, uh, but a lot of those large species um, went extinct at the end of the last ice age. Um, where in the old world, some of these big birds are still around. This is another large old world vulture, the griffin vulture. Um, this is the bird that often uh, participates in um, Tibetan sky burials, uh, which is when um, humans' bodies are uh, prepared and ritualistically sort of placed on, on a mountainside for uh, the vultures to come in, kind of help eat them. Um, and it's seen as a final act of charity. Um, they are very, very large birds. Um, this is one of my favorite species. I mean, they're all my favorite, but this is one of my favorite species. This is the bearded vulture, um, also known as um, the uh, lammergeier, um, although they were trying to get away from using that name. All, um, another old name for the bird is the ossifrage, which I think is a pretty neat name. It means like bone eater. And you can <laughs> see that this bird um, is indeed eating a bone. So this is uh, this bird's diet is 80% or greater made up of bone marrow. Um, so this is one of the last birds to come to a carcass to eat. That lappet faced vulture from a, um, two pictures ago is one of the uh, kind of first birds at a carcass to kind of open it up with that really big beak. And then um, these birds uh, would then be sort of the ones to kind of come in at the end and finish, finish the cleanup. And what's my computer doing? Moving over to the new world now, we've got uh, this. This is a, a beautiful species that I've not seen in the wild, although I've seen it fairly often in zoos. Um, this is the king vulture. Um, if you've been to Costa Rica, um, Nicaragua, you may have seen one of these birds in the wild. They're just uh, an amazing large species with very, very colorful faces um, with a lot of strange um, lumpy stuff on the faces. And then here is our, our friend, the California condor, um, who is, you know, often people describe them as, as ugly, but I think these birds too are, are very, very beautiful with their, their pink faces and their black spiky feathers. Uh, and they can um, puff up that, that skin, their faces to look, uh, look puffier. They can blush, their, their skin color changes depending on um, age and other factors. And they've got these beautiful red eyes. And of course, California condors are critically endangered. Um, you probably are all familiar with the story of the birds getting down to uh, 22 individuals in the 1980s and then all being captured and uh, um, 
being put into captive breeding programs so they could um, bring the species back. And they are still critically endangered, but uh, they've been successful. And I forget the count at the time, but I believe that we're up to maybe 500 or so condors in the wild. Maybe it's even more than that now. Um, but their, their, their range is restricted to uh, pretty much California, um, Baja, Mexico, um, Arizona, Utah. Uh, sometimes they might show up kind of wandering in, in other states in that region, um, but they used to have a wider range. They've even found the remains of California condors, I believe, as far away as New York. And there would have been other species during the last ice age that were even bigger than California condors. Um, Teratorns are an extinct family of, of large vultures that probably took live prey in addition to scavenging that were enormous. Um, the largest flying bird ever was a teratorn that lived in Argentina and it was the size of like a small Cessna airplane and they have, of course are extinct. Um, but more recently, um, there was a bird called the Miriam's Teratorn that would have disappeared at the end of the last ice age. And there are um, quite a lot of individuals that they have found um, in the La Brea tar pits. Uh, but we have um, a uh, not as many now. A lot of the megafauna that these birds would have eaten um, have disappeared along probably before the scavengers disappeared. So more big picture stuff. So even though they're not closely related and they look quite different from each other, they're primarily scavengers. Vultures everywhere, worldwide, primarily scavengers. Uh, they they um, usually have a st strong stomach acid um, and gut flora that allows them to eat dangerous pathogens. And it varies a little bit depending on the vulture species, but overall they can eat really rotten sort of gross stuff and not get sick and they can neutralize those pathogens. So in their droppings, there aren't any traces of um, what they have eaten. So they can eat rabies, anthrax, botulism, toxin, um, polio, cholera, other diseases and neutralize them. Uh, there, there in the past, there was a worry that vultures could maybe spread disease if they were standing on a diseased carcass. And although that, that uh, can potentially happen, it is not thought to happen as often as people believed um, 50 or 100 years ago. Uh, vultures expel liquid waste often onto their legs and feet um, to sort of, and that liquid waste is acidic also and has some, it's uh, been suggested that it has some um, antimicrobial properties to kind of clean up their feet from standing on dead things. But we'll talk more about droppings in a little while. Um, vultures quickly and efficiently remove carcasses that otherwise might kind of lie around and contaminate some of the water, soil, and air. And of course, removing carcasses quickly reduces the number and concentration of mammalian scavengers uh, which can spread diseases like rabies. I mean, rabies is spread through saliva. And if you've got a bunch of mammals kind of crowding around a carcass, maybe fighting with each other, biting each other, um, there's the potential for rabies to spread, uh, which nobody, nobody wants. So coming around to my friend, the turkey vulture now, which of course is um, everybody's favorite bird, right? Uh, it's the world's most widespread and probably or maybe uh, most abundant vulture species. Um, it's, uh, there's another species that is almost as abundant or equally as abundant uh, as turkey vultures and that is uh, the black vulture. Uh, about 30% of the world's uh, turkey vultures live in North America, breed in North America, and, but only about 10% of the world's black vultures um, breed in North America. Uh, but whatever the case, there are a lot of both species. Um, turkey vultures breed from southern Canada to the tip of Argentina. So if you think about that, it's a huge breeding range. Uh, and they're in a lot of different kind of habitats throughout that range. Um, the grasslands, the deserts, the coastlines, forests, mountains. I mean, pretty much uh, anywhere <laughs> there are dead things, you might find turkey vultures in North America. Um, they're not going to be in the very cold areas um, in northern Canada. Um, it's believed that turkey vultures evolved in the tropics, kind of would have originated in the tropics and spread spread from there. Um, or, so getting out of the cold is still pretty important for them. And uh, 
Oh, I mentioned that this global population is huge. There may be as many as 15 to 20 million individual turkey vultures. If you want to compare that to my other favorite species, the cerulean warbler, uh, there are probably only three to 400,000 cerulean warblers worldwide. Um, comparing that to 20 million individual turkey vultures, that's quite a lot. And uh, I've read that that they estimate black vultures to be at about the same about the same number of black vultures. Um, so quite quite a lot of both of those species. Um, there are six, uh, usually six subspecies of turkey vulture. Um, some sources have five subspecies. But uh, most folks agree that there are six subspecies, three that breed in North America and three that breed in the tropics. And those different subspecies have different migratory strategies, which I think is, is pretty fascinating. The subspecies are quite different from each other. Some of these, uh, some subspecies are complete migrants, so they all leave an area. Uh, like the cerulean warbler, for example, is another a complete migrant. Broadwinged hawks are complete migrants. So all the individuals kind of shuttle from one place to somewhere else. Uh, some, uh, some subspecies of turkey vultures are partial migrants though. So they uh, may be in an area all year um, or they may migrate, but just not very far. They may migrate slowly. And our Eastern turkey vultures are considered partial migrants. So they don't, they don't generally, they move, they do move south in the winter, but they don't go farther than Miami. Um, but uh, turkey vultures from New England, you know, may spend the winter on, like say the Jersey Shore or uh, Southern Virginia, um, North Carolina, um, or all the way to Florida, but they don't, the Eastern birds don't generally go any further than, than Florida. Uh, and then there are some populations that are um, non-migratory, turkey vultures that live on the Falkland Islands, for example, um, stay there all year, and the Caribbean turkey vultures stay there all year um, as well. Uh, this is this map, which is just, it's such an impressive map of this range. I mean, there aren't many birds that have a range that looks quite like this one. Um, you can see up in south central Canada, the northern edge, that those, those birds and most of the birds from the west and the upper west, um, the red color, so they are complete, those are the complete migrants that all leave that area and they go to the tropics, um, or some of them go to the tropics in the, in the winter. But that purple area is where you can find turkey vultures all year long. Um, you can see how densely populated they are in the American South um, and in Central America. And then as you get further into South America, uh, you might notice some blank spots on the maps, um, the, like the, the, the Andes Mountains in um, Chile and uh, Peru are, you know, and the bottom of Argentina there are sort of free of turkey vultures. Those would be very cold areas where there would be a lot of snow. Um, the turkey vultures tend to stay out of those areas. Um, and we'll come back to a map again in a couple minutes. But first, we have to make sure we know what we're talking about when we're talking about a turkey vulture. Like, what are we looking for? Because we're all bird watchers. Uh, turkey vultures probably get mistaken for eagles uh, pretty regularly. Um, I've had friends say things to me like, oh, Katie, I know you like birds. Um, I saw, you know, five or six golden eagles all circling together. Um, you know, and I say, well, you know, this sounds like maybe turkey vultures. No, 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 Katie, you know, these were beautiful birds. They weren't vultures. Um, but uh, they've got, a, turkey vultures have about the same wingspan um, as, uh, as an eagle, as a bald eagle. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes on the slide I should mention from um, Desert Solitaire by um, Edward Abbey, one of my favorite authors. Let us praise the noble turkey vulture. No one envies him, he harms nobody, and he contemplates our little world from a most serene and noble height. So this is the view that you're most often going to get of a turkey vulture when you're standing on the ground. Uh, you'll notice that the undersides of the wings and tail are light. The tail is relatively um, long and thin. And you can remember that turkey vultures have silver linings. Uh, and that's different. That separates it from um, other species, other large soaring birds. Um, things like, uh, you know, black vultures look different. Um, bald and golden eagles look different from underneath. So if they've got this sort of uh, uh, light, undersides of the wings and tail, long thin tail, and they hardly ever flap their wings. Um, 
They are very good at very good at conserving energy. They can't create their own meals because they are considered obligate scavengers, obligate scavengers. So that conserving their energy is uh, very important to them. So they don't flap. They flap uh, less often than black vultures and eagles um, and other soaring birds. Up close, and this is a turkey vulture named Lou, uh, who's a very handsome bird. This is his handsome side. Um, he was hit by a vehicle and he's missing his eye on the other side. Um, so he, this is sort of the, the good side. <laughs> uh, but here in the Eastern US, they weigh about four pounds. So even though they have this um, five to six foot wingspan, which is really similar to a bald eagle, they weigh like half of what, or, or uh, less than half of what a bald eagle weighs. Um, a, a bald eagle, even a small bald eagle, um, might weigh, you know, 10, 10 pounds or so, 10 to 12 pounds. So uh, they are a lot lighter than an eagle, but they have this big um, wingspan. They have chicken feet, which is something important to mention. And I think you can see on Lou's picture, the way he's standing here on this, um, this log, their feet are not really meant for grasping and carrying anything. Uh, I have chickens and their feet are um, very similar. Uh, Turkey vultures don't pick up prey and carry it away. They may drag something, drag a piece of roadkill like off the road or away from other vultures or something, but they can't put it in their feet and carry it. And when they drag it, they drag it with their beaks, not their feet. So uh, people have all kinds of like wild stories about turkey vultures doing things that is just not biologically possible. Um, this bird cannot grab your cat in its talons and fly away with it. Um, a great horned owl may be able to do that, but a turkey vulture does not have the right kind of feet for grasping. They're, they're very good for um, standing on the ground, standing on a flat surface, um, standing on a large branch or a cliff edge. Um, and they do have toenails that are sharp that they can sort of hold some uh, kind of balance and tear chunks off while uh, standing on something with their foot, sort of like, sort of like you might with a knife, a knife and a fork. Um, and up close, here's the other part of the, the knife and fork, depending on which one is which one you think is which. Um, this uh, is a very handsome face of a turkey vulture who was hit by a vehicle, and he ended up in the tr truck bed of the vehicle that hit him. Um, the person who hit him, however, did not notice that there was a turkey vulture. Uh, he knew he hit the bird. He went back and couldn't find it and then drove home, went to bed, and came out the next morning and the bird was standing in the back of his truck. Um, so the bird ended up with us at the ACCA for, uh, for rehabilitation. And we were able to get him back out, uh, nurse back to health and release him back out into the wild. But if you look at this, this sharp curved beak, um, that's what a turkey vulture uses to tear those chunks off. And they can tear off fairly big chunks um, and they can open their mouths very, very wide and swallow these big chunks. However, uh, you'll, you'll notice that this, this bird's beak is certainly not as large and strong as like that lappet-faced vulture, that griffin vulture from the beginning of the presentation. Um, this is a bird that sometimes has to wait for a carcass to be opened by something else, um, or it has to sort of get into a carcass through a place that's already an opening or that's already soft. Um, they, they have trouble kind of biting through really thick hides with that beak. Um, but it's, it is still very sharp and it does hurt if it bites you. Uh, you might also notice, speaking of, its, of this turkey vulture's mouth, that its tongue, if you look closely, is serrated like a saw blade. And this helps the birds swallow chunks of slippery stuff like organs or uh, you know, other sort of sort of things that might slip away if you're eating it. So that serrated tongue kind of helps them swallow those chunks of food and move them to the back of the throat. Um, another thing that stands out about turkey vultures are these very prominent nostrils right on the tops of their heads. And you can see right through in one side and right out the other side. Uh, turkey vultures do have um, a good sense of smell. Um, other vulture species, uh, don't, are not thought to have a very good sense of smell. Black vultures um, will sometimes follow turkey vultures to see where the food is because turkey vultures are often very good at finding food. They also have excellent eyesight in addition to their excellent sense of smell. 
There are two other species of vulture that do use a sense of smell. That's the um, greater and lesser yellow-headed vulture. Vultures, they live in the, those two species live in the tropics and they look a lot like a turkey vulture. They just have a slightly different colored face skin, um, but they're, but they're uh, very closely related and they also use their sense of smell. Uh, what else about this guy? Not many feathers on his face. Um, a lot of vultures have bare heads. They stick their faces into carcasses. Um, this is an eastern turkey vulture, of course, was at ACCA. And a lot of our eastern birds have these warty things on their faces, kind of in front of their eyes. But what's pretty interesting about this uh, is that they are not usually found in this, this many, this many are not usually found on captive turkey vultures or that have birds that have been captive for most of their lives. Um, the birds, turkey vultures in the tropics don't usually have these warty growths like this. So uh, I am not entirely sure I know the whole story of what they are. Um, and how the birds get them. I mean, the assumption is that they're getting it from something that they're eating or that they put their faces in something and somehow get something that causes these growths on their faces. But I have not read a satisfactory explanation yet. But uh, this is Boris, um, the bird I mentioned who lives at ACCA, who I will admit is kind of pampered. <laughs> um, we love her and we um, give her, you know, spoil her with all the things that we can. And you'll notice that she doesn't have these warty um, growths on her face. She uh, has been with us since she was about one year old. So she, um, baby, the birds are not born with those warts on their faces. Uh, so she didn't have any warty growths when she came in as a, as a young bird and she still doesn't have any. Um, and now she's about six or six or seven years old now. Um, and that still doesn't have any warts on her face. So I will get to the bottom of that at some point and let you know. <laughs> Um, I mentioned that turkey vultures are obligate scavengers, so their diet is carrion, dead animals. Um, they've uh, documented them eating uh, a few a few cases of them eating live prey, but it's they're not equipped to do it. And when they have eaten live prey, it's been more like they walk up to something and swallow it, you know, rather than they kill something. So this would be like small fish. Uh, wash up on a beach and they're not, they're maybe they're not quite dead yet and a turkey vulture walks over and swallows them. Um, things of that nature. Uh, they're not, they're not um, just not equipped to kill anything. They're not fast moving birds. They don't have, um, they're not, not put together. They're made to, to scavenge. However, uh, they, they can learn where reliable sources of carrion happen. So if there is an area where uh, maybe a lot of animals get hit by cars on the same stretch of the road, or maybe um, the Department of Highways or uh, somebody dumps um, a lot of deer carcasses that are roadkill in the same area. The turkey vultures will learn where that is. Or if there's a farm where carcasses are disposed of on site or slaughterhouse, something like that, um, where there might be some awful around, turkey vultures can learn and congregate in those areas. I don't know that they actually cheer on, you know, the rabbits get run, go get run over, but um, they learn where reliable sources of carrion occur um, and tend to, to congregate in those areas. Um, there are a lot of great turkey vulture comics when you start saying you like turkey vultures and vulture comics in general. Um, we already talked about uh, most of this stuff. I'm a turkey vulture. Yes, indeed, my head is bare to prevent rotting flesh from adhering to it. Um, to keep cool, I poop on my legs and feet. That's another reason that these birds uh, expel their liquid waste onto their legs. It's called urohydrosis. And other species do it as well. California condors do it, black vultures do it, uh, storks do it also, um, some other species. We usually call that an accident in my house when someone um, expels liquid waste onto their legs or feet, but uh, for vultures it serves a purpose. Um, my main defense is projectile vomiting, um, which is also another fascinating thing that these birds do that not a lot of other species do. Uh, if a turkey vulture is threatened, they will um, just kind of bleh, just kind of throw up uh, whatever they've recent whatever's in their crop that they've recently eaten. And this is this works as a defense for a few reasons. Uh, if it, if it's a human um, who's bothering the turkey vulture, we might just be disgusted and back off. Uh, if it's an animal like a raccoon or 
a coyote or something like that, um, uh, they may eat that vomit and leave the vulture alone, which sounds pretty gross. But if you think, you know, if you're at a, standing at a, at a deer carcass and eating and eating and eating, and then a coyote comes and decides it wants to eat too, uh, vomiting and flying away uh, might be a better strategy than sort of trying to trying to compete with that that mammal. Uh, I have a beagle, and I guarantee you that she would eat turkey vulture vomit, you know, if given the chance. Uh, it also helps lighten the load um, before they fly away. So they're not super fast getting off the ground. Sometimes it can take them a minute to do that. So kind of clearing out their crop can kind of lighten the load and um, allow them to take off a little more quickly. So um, speaking of vulture vomit, and I'll get to this in, in one, one second, but uh, vultures uh, don't build traditional nests. They nest in uh, caves, cliffs, and abandoned structures. Uh, they've documented them nesting in um, deer hunting, tree stands, uh, attics of houses, um, haylofts of barns, um, big hollow trees, sometimes on the ground um, under like a brush pile. Uh, they've even documented them nesting in cars in junkyards. Uh, but they don't build a nest. They may like drag some sticks or leaves around with their beaks, but they don't actually build any nests. They can't carry any, any sticks back to their nest. Um, this is one in a, in a cave and this is in a hayloft. And if you notice on the kind of lower right corner of the screen, there's some brownish red lumps and that is turkey vulture vomit. That's baby turkey vulture vomit. So, you know, baby turkey vulture vomit is uh, worse than adult turkey vulture vomit because it is uh, twice partially digested roadkill. Uh, the parent vultures are getting that food back to the nest um, in their crops. So they, they feed at a carcass and fly back to the nest and then uh, regurgitate for the babies. Um, there's no, and that's how the babies are fed the entire time they're in the nest. They're fed by regurgitation by their parents. So then when someone bothers a baby turkey vulture in the nest and they vomit, it's roadkill or you know, a dead animal that's been in a bird's crop twice, which is uh, it, if that stuff gets in your car, you know, it smells, it smells really bad. Uh, so they have, they have uh, two eggs um, once a year. So sometimes the nests will have uh, one egg, but uh, I've, and I've, I've heard of cases with three, but it's almost always two eggs. Um, both of the parents incubate equally and they will sort of switch off uh, so that the you know, father and the mother both will, both will sit on the eggs, which is not true for all bird species. Um, those eggs hatch after about a month, which is um, pretty typical for, uh, for a bird this size. But the babies are in the nest for quite a long time. Um, they, they leave the nest when they're about 60 days old, which is uh, roughly twice as long as something like a Cooper's hawk or a red-tailed hawk. So the babies are in there for a while. Even after they leave the nest, uh, they stay close to it for several weeks. Um, and then they eventually will leave the nest site and go hang out with all the other vultures at about 12 weeks or 84 days old. So that starts happening, you know, the time of year you start seeing that is the fall, uh, you know, September, October, all of a sudden, um, you've got all these vultures together and everybody says, oh my gosh, they're, they're invading our property, they're everywhere. Um, and those are often uh, the babies from all the nests and also, you know, the adults, both adults from all the nests. So vultures might use a roost uh, I mean, the adults might use the roost all year, even when they have nests, they have eggs. Uh, the one parent will sit on the eggs for um, half the time and then leave to go to a communal roost and the other parent will come back and you know, they'll kind of switch off. But then once the babies leave the nest, you've got both parents at the roost and both babies at the roost. So you're really um, you know, quadrupling the size of birds at your roost once you get into you know, September or so. Uh, and then they'll start sort of moving, uh, moving south, uh, depending on where you are in the world, um, kind of, kind of in loose groups. We'll talk more about roosts in a minute, but that's sort of why that one reason why there, there's the the roosts seem to get so much bigger in the fall. Um, up close, now look at that face. That's an adorable face, right? Hopefully, everybody watching just went, oh, because it's very, very cute. 
Uh, baby turkey vultures, you'll notice, are pretty different looking from the adults. Uh, their down feathers are white. Um, they have gray skin on their faces instead of red. They don't get that red face until they're at least a year old, sometimes a little bit older. Uh, their eyes are sort of bluish when they're babies and they sort of turn to a browner color as they age. And the end of their beak too um, will fade, fade from black to white um, as they get older. And sometimes you'll still be able to see some of the, the black on it even when they're over a year old, but it will be white, all white eventually. Um, you can also see that the bird does not have any warts on its face. Uh, somebody at um, a presentation said that this looks like Bernie Sanders um, and now like I can't unsee it every time that this slide comes up. Um, but anyway, so what are we doing with these baby turkey vultures? I should mention that I have these nest pictures because uh, you have to have a permit to go in and bother these birds at their nests. They are federally protected species, um, but we are part of a, uh, a study group that looks at uh, contaminate contaminants, uh, migration, and population in turkey vultures. So we travel to uh, known turkey vulture nests in West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and we uh, take babies out of the nests for about usually about 15 minutes. We weigh them, we take some measurements, we take a blood sample to test for lead. So in the back of this picture is a lead care 2 kit and that allows you to get um, a reading on how much lead is in the bird's blood in, a, in only a couple minutes. Um, and how do these birds uh, get lead is the question that, that people ask pretty frequently. Um, well, this is us taking blood, uh, taking blood from a bird. We, the, we don't usually even see the adults when the birds are this age, or, or they might just kind of fly overhead, but uh, the babies are left alone for long periods of time um, when they're this old. So, uh, they get lead from a few different sources. Um, one, one source is spent ammunition. So the birds go out and uh, let's say, you know, someone shoots a deer, field dresses the carcass, and uh, lead can fragment into tiny pieces. And birds like California condors or bald eagles or turkey vultures or golden eagles or red-tailed hawks can inadvertently swallow those little pieces of lead and become sick. Turkey vultures, however, can handle um, a lot more lead than uh, uh, eagles or hawks or even condors. Um, for uh, whatever reason, turkey vultures can, since they can handle a lot more of it in their systems, uh, they can are a good species to study because they can give you a sense of how much lead is out there in the environment because they don't die from it, where a bald eagle um, only has to eat a very small piece of lead to become very, very sick, where a turkey vulture can handle a lot more. Um, they also can get lead from coal-fired power plant emissions, um, from smelting plant emissions, um, and those were the th usually the three biggest sources of lead that I've I've found: spent ammunition and coal-fired power plants being the top. The top. Uh, if you want to read more about this, lead it could be its own presentation or its own several presentations, but uh, chronic lead exposure is epidemic in obligate scavenger populations in eastern North America um, is a, a paper that, uh, that's my husband Jesse in this picture, was one of the authors um, sort of looking at how much lead uh, were in a group of vultures that, that were part of this study. So, uh, Taking lead from these, these babies, we just, the baby vultures, we kind of make it a family affair. Those are my kids that we, we bring them with us to help and we make them take notes. Um, we take a bunch of different, different measurements. Um, this is uh, from this past summer, of course, because we're in our COVID masks, um, measuring, measuring parts of the beak. We also measure parts of the feet and parts of the wings. And then uh, before we release the birds, we give them, uh, if they're old enough, we give them a wing tag. And one of our, one of the um, groups we partner with is Hawk Mountain in Pennsylvania. And that's where, who provides us with these wing tags. And they are a uh, light floppy, similar to cattle ear tags. And they just, they're thin, the skin is very thin um, right around that tendon. So it's just sort of like a, get it like a punch, like a hole punch. Um, when I first uh, saw this, I was worried about it, like the, the tags were too big or the vultures wouldn't be able to fly with them. And I was, I learned that uh, 
these are the same kind of tags that uh, the California condors wear. And before they put these tags on California condors, they tested them pretty extensively on turkey vultures to make sure that the birds could still fly. Um, and they could, as long as they're placed properly, they don't seem to cause a problem for the birds. And of course, it allows you to uh, see the bird, be on the ground and see the bird and not have to recapture it to try to read a band or something. Also, uh, since these birds do expel liquid waste onto their legs and feet, that can corrode a metal leg band to make it difficult, difficult to read. So uh, the wing tags are a lot more um, healthy for the bird. Uh, you, you know, you wouldn't want to get a bunch of um, droppings caked onto uh, the band on these birds' legs. So this particular turkey vulture uh, was one that we banded in 2016 in Avella, Pennsylvania, which is very western Pennsylvania. Uh, typically. Uh, if we have any of our tagged birds recited, they are from right around the nest. This guy, though, or girl, was recited in, in West Palm Beach, Florida, just a few months um, after after being tagged. Uh, so this is the far greatest distance that we have to this day um, that we've had any of our birds recited, and we were able to um, get in touch with the bird watcher who. Uh, made the observation and he said that there wasn't anything remarkable. It was just a turkey vulture with a group of other turkey vultures and it was eating on a carcass. Um, the only thing that made it stand out was that it was wearing a wing tag. So uh, it was really cool to hear about that, to see about how far, you know, our, our uh, young vulture from uh, Pennsylvania made it. This is a, another vulture wearing a transmitter. That's rectangular thing in the middle of her back. Um, is a transmitter that uses, it's a solar powered transmitter that uses cell phone towers to send, uh, to send back to um, the lab where she, where she has flown. Uh, it's, I don't fully understand the technology, but I think basically when she flies by a tower, the, her, it pings the tower, her transmitter pings the tower. So this is a bird who came into the ACCA for rehabilitation and she was, had been shot in Tucker County, West Virginia. And we did not give this bird a wing tag because we were a little concerned about giving her too much extra stuff to wear. But we did have this transmitter donated to us. Um, and this is the, to my knowledge, this is the only turkey vulture in West Virginia that um, has ever been wearing a transmitter. And this is where she went. So this map on the left, uh, shows the star is where she was released, this sort of long thin map on the left. So she was released in September 2014 and she flew to northern Georgia and back. And when she flew back to West Virginia, she did not come back to where she was released. She went back to Tucker County uh, near where she had been originally injured. So she showed a pretty strong sight fidelity to where she came from rather than where she was released, which is interesting. And from there, she went back to uh, southern or southern South Carolina, northern Georgia again, and then came back. Unfortunately, we haven't had any data from her since uh, the late fall of 2016. That doesn't necessarily mean she died, um, although it could mean that. But that was also when uh, AT&T shut down their 2G cell towers, and. Uh, for some reason that may make her transmitter not quite work as well. So, uh, and since she doesn't have any wing tags, we don't have any way of, you know, catching or tracking down this bird. Um, she's kind of flying around with an old cell phone, but uh, it's pretty amazing that we were able to, to get this data of where a West Virginia turkey vulture goes. Uh, Hawk Mountain puts transmitters on um, a lot of, a lot of uh, turkey vultures. Uh, this is uh, from all over all over the world, all over the hemisphere. This particular turkey vulture nests in Saskatchewan, in Leoville, Saskatchewan. It's one of the northernmost nests that people have found. Uh, Leo and her mates have been together since 2007. And they, as far as I know, they're still together. I haven't heard any different. Uh, they may have been together for longer than 2007. That's just when the transmitters were put on those birds. Uh, they nest in the same abandoned farmhouse attic, and they migrate on a very similar path in the spring and then back in the fall. 
Uh, the Leo spends the winters usually um, in a farm on the Venezuela Colombia border, and her mate spends the winters further down into in Colombia. So they kind of have separate winter vacations. Um, turkey vultures are again thought to be strong pair bonders that mate for life. So uh, like many large large raptor species. So these Leo and uh, other turkey vultures that breed in Canada are the complete migrants that go to Mexico, go to, go to Central South America. If you've been to Veracruz and seen that river of raptors, the turkey vultures that you're seeing are turkey vultures then from the upper west. They're not our eastern birds. And then our third subspecies of turkey vulture, kind of a similar uh, in its migration um, as the eastern turkey vultures are. The southwestern turkey vultures, some of them stay all year in Arizona, some of them migrate sort of deeper into Mexico uh, or a little bit further, a little bit further south than Mexico, but um, they probably don't, most of them seem to not cross the Panama Canal and then they come back. So they have a, a, a slower, you know, a slower migration and they don't go quite as far as the complete migrants. This is map, a uh, map using eBird data to show the abundance of, of turkey vultures throughout the year. I am obsessed with these maps. So just everybody watch. We're gonna see where all the, this is January. We're gonna see where the turkey vultures go. There they come back to North America. There they're having their babies, having their babies. Babies are leaving the nests. Babies are fledging. Wow, and then everybody leaves. <laughs> And uh, you can see that something, something similar sort of happens in South America. Uh, when it gets cold, when it's winter at the bottom of South America, the birds tend to get out of that area um, where, it's, where it's really cold. Um, and then they, they go back into that area when the northern birds kind of come down into South America. But it's, um, uh, it's kind of amazing that we have that they just empty out of the upper west like that. Oops, we don't need to watch it again. So I want to talk for just a couple minutes um, about black vultures, since this is a bird that is also a really neat bird, but it has a much worse reputation than a turkey vulture, um, even though it's adorable. Uh, so that this particular black vulture is a bird named Maverick, who lives at the ACCA now, who was hit by a vehicle, and he was in the parking lot of a bar called Mavericks, um, and unfortunately he uh, is not able to fly well enough um, to return to the wild. So black vultures are a species really of the southern, here in the US, they're mostly found in the south, um, although they are pushing, you know, pr showing up further and further north on Christmas bird counts um, every year. Uh, there are a couple different reasons for this, why they might be showing up further north. But before I get to that, I wanted to show you the comparison between a turkey vulture and a black vulture, um, how the black vultures have sort of white hands on the ends of their wings, whereas turkey vultures have that silver lining. Uh, black vultures also have a very kind of short tail, whereas to the turkey vulture's tail is longer. Black vultures also tend to flap more. So uh, this is the black vulture abundance map. Um, you can see that they are uh, not in, really not in much of the United States. It looks similar to the way the turkey vulture, to the turkey vulture map um, when the birds are, are gone for the winter. But I'm gonna play this and you'll notice that the movement is not as dramatic. So Whereas black vultures may, you can see they're moving around a little bit throughout the year. For the most part, where you have black vultures for part of the year, you have them for all the year. And it's not 100% the case, but they don't move around as much as the turkey vultures do. You can also see that black vultures are, there's a, there are some in New England and uh, up in New York, some um, uh, sightings of them. You can see kind of the northern part of their range, but Getting out of the cold is important for this species also. You can see they're even less in those uh, Andy, Andean mountains um, in South America, and they are, they are even uh, not as far south in South America where it's extremely cold. Um, there used to be a Western black vulture that is now extinct, that went extinct at the end of the last ice age. So that perhaps um, filled, sort of filled that ecological niche on the other side of, the, of North America. And I always sort of think black vultures will move further that way. Um, I guess that we will see, uh, but they do, they do seem to be showing up further north um, than, than they have in the past. And there are a couple different reasons for that. One, and they're all sort of mostly theories. I don't think we've proven why they're showing up further north, but one theory is that you know we're getting warmer. The planet is getting warmer. 
uh, it's allowing allowing birds to stay in the north that would normally have to get out of the cold. Uh, also, we have this beautiful interstate highway system that kind of keeps the roads free of ice and snow. And the, so the roads tend to stay warm and that heat rises uh, off those warm roads. So that not only gives the birds, serves up food for vultures in the, in the, in the form of roadkill, it also gives them columns of warm air to soar along uh, as they're, you know, as they're, as they're cruising above a highway, they're, 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 it allows them to stay warmer and it gives them food. And interstate highways are still fairly new, uh, you know, in the, in, if you think about it from a, you know, a larger time scale. Um, so uh, as things get warmer, the birds, and, oh, I should also mention that black vultures, like most raptor species, were heavily persecuted um, in North America, uh, and they're, you know, shot and bounties, just um, like many other raptor species. So since they um, were granted protection, um, their numbers have been, have increased. So it's possible that these birds may be just sort of returning to where they had been before, and we just aren't quite sure where they would have been before. Uh, black vultures, their, their diet is, is almost exclusively carrion, but they're reported to sometimes attack weak or dying animals, which is, you know, where they get this like reputation, <coughs> excuse me, uh, for, you know, attacking, especially newborn livestock or livestock as they're being born. Um, and it's what's, there are a few interesting things about this behavior. One is one interesting thing is that it doesn't happen everywhere. There are black vultures. It seems to be fairly localized, uh, even on, even to the extent where you could have farms next to each other and one farm reports that their livestock are attacked by black vultures, whereas the farm next door will say it never happens. Um, so uh, there's the theory that if, it's, if this is happening, it's learned, learned behavior. Black vultures do tend to congregate in groups of uh, related, re the, where the birds are sort of related to each other, like young from previous years uh, may join up with each other and, that, and the group might be an extended family. Uh, it's also possible that, um, uh, I, I mean, I guess we don't really know. There's research ongoing as to why some of this, sometimes they are reported to do this in some locations, but in other locations they aren't. But there are ways to minimize the risk uh, by keeping pregnant livestock near humans uh, or in a barn or, or having large dogs around. Um, black vultures, just like turkey vultures, they still have chicken feet. So they're not carrying anything away in their feet. Um, they if they, whatever they attack, they do that, they, they would be doing it with their beaks, like walking or hopping up to it on the ground and uh, pecking or tearing at it with their beaks. They're not swooping in and carrying something away in their feet, uh, like an eagle um, or a hawk or something would. So this is long, I don't, we don't need to read all these words, but something um, people often, I will see news articles that say things like, Black vultures are they're these they're they're from somewhere else. They're this like invasive species that's not from here. You know where are these all these black vultures coming from? They must be coming from you know some other country. Um, and and uh, the truth is that these black vultures are of course native to the eastern United States. Um, and this is John James Audubon's uh, Birds of America, 1827, 1838 species account of the black vulture. This bird is a constant resident in all our southern states, extends far up the Mississippi, continues the whole year in Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois, and even in Ohio, as far as Cincinnati. So I mean, along the Atlantic coast, it is, I believe, rarely seen further east than Maryland. So that range that he's describing is not all that different from the range that, of where they are today, except they're a little up into Pennsylvania and New York. But uh, the range is this, the range he's describing 200 years ago um, is where they are found now, but I have seen articles from out of, you know, Indiana, Kentucky saying like, where are these birds come from? Um, you know, they're returning to their previous range in this, in this case anyway. Uh, and then this description, Audubon's description, he could be, it's this very, writing the description today, although they're shy in the woods, it's half domesticated in and about our cities, where it finds food without the necessity of using much exertion. Charleston, Savannah, New Orleans, Natchez, other cities are amply provided with these birds. 
which may be seen flying or walking about the streets the whole day in groups. <laughs> they alight on the roofs and chimney tops wherever these are not guarded by spikes or pieces of glass. So uh, black vultures being hanging out on roofs in the cities is something that they were doing 200 years ago. Um, it's not, not necessarily a new phenomenon, even though you may have not seen it in our, in our lifetimes. Uh, black vultures are really good at learning where reliable sources of food come from, similar to turkey vultures, uh, except black vultures have an even wider uh, diet than turkey vultures. So even though it's almost exclusively carrion, they also will eat uh, vegetables um, that's rotting in fields, trash, uh, dumpsters, you know, someone threw away a hamburger, a black vulture might eat it. Uh, they've, they've documented them eating horse manure, cow manure, uh, cat food, dog food that's left outside for outdoor animals, uh, black vultures will eat. Uh, Maverick, the black vulture at ACCA, likes watermelon. Um, these, these two vultures were, I, I took this picture, at Mayaka River State Park near Sarasota, Florida, where these birds were walking around uh, checking the grills for food. Like the big predator has come through and eaten its meat and, and there are leftovers and the scavengers come in behind and clean up the leftovers. It's not, maybe not quite how you would imagine the natural system, but it really is, if you think about it, the big predator coming in, uh, taking what it wants and leaving leftovers for the scavengers. So this, uh, so there's a dead mouse in here. So if you don't like dead mice, um, don't watch, but this is Maverick. We, this black vultures are I've, possibly, I mean, they're very close to being my favorite species along with turkey vultures, but they are, uh, Maverick is such a busy bird. I mean, he, we have to give him a lot of enrichment items to interact with, to keep him, keep his brain working. Uh, this, this ball is um, uh, with holes in it is for, for, you know, meant for dogs, not for black vultures, but we can put his food inside and he has to kind of work to get his food out. And uh, you can kind of see how he uses those feet to sort of kind of hold them down while he tears little chunks off. And he could swallow a mice whole. He doesn't have to tear the chunks off. He's just not super hungry. So other things though about, about black vultures. So I can't explain this behavior. This bird is really fun to uh, see what kind of enrichment items he'll interact with. I don't know why he plays fetch with, with plastic ball pit balls, but he does. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's um, pretty fun to watch. And we do hide little bits of food in this dish that he kind of has to pick through to find little bits of food. But uh, he chases these ball pit balls around even when there's no food involved. And this, this is the first day that Maverick had this puzzle feeder that's meant for dogs. We put little bits of food underneath these sliders and he had to figure out how to move the sliders to get the food out. And I mean, I think it took him 10 seconds to figure out um, that he had to move these things to get food. Uh, and this, the, watching him work with, there he goes, watching him work with, with this, these items is just a fascinating. And it's really, really fun for the ACCA's volunteers and staff to kind of try to come up with ways to stump the black vulture, uh, which shouldn't be that difficult, but he's, he's very, very good um, at finding food, uh, figuring out how, how things work. Okay, so, oops, we don't need to see that again. Okay, so kind of getting to the end of my presentation here. You know, okay, I get we need vultures, they're amazing, but you know, vultures scare me is what people often say. Uh, this says, wait up guys, here it is. Yep, we're good to go, he's an organ donor. And I think that part of partially why vultures are scary is this idea that they might eat us after we die. And then when you get these roosts of vultures, uh, which you probably have in Southern Maryland, um, pretty frequently, it can be scary. Uh, why are all these vultures? What do they know? Are they are they coming to get me? You know, do they? Am I going to die? Uh, you know, and of course, the roosts are not uh, necessarily because because you're going to die, right? They roost vultures roost together for a couple of reasons. One is this location; it's got to have good wind. There has to be food nearby somewhere, and it's got to be pretty warm. Uh, and there's social reasons to do it, like they can follow each other to food. Um, black vultures roost in those extended family groups. Uh, but, I, but something important to remember about a vulture roost is that 
uh, it'll seem a lot smaller in the in the spring and summer because the birds are are raising their young, and then those roosts sort of you know grow hugely in size once all the all the young birds join both adults uh, at the roost site. So some people, some fears that people have, uh, you know, do vultures attack people? Um, and you know, only if they're dead. Like if I, if <laughs> if I, uh, I haven't been able to find any any cases of vultures actually attacking people. Um, there are lots of cases of vultures eating dead people, um, which is sort of what they're supposed to do. Uh, but most vulture species prefer dead herbivores, um, deer, cattle, poultry. I mean, I am a vegetarian, so maybe me, but uh, they're, they're often not eating dead carnivores, although they will if they're hungry enough. Um, you know, here's uh, my, uh, the black vulture maverick, you know, not attacking a child. Uh, this is my daughter, Cora, who's actually um, named after black vultures. The black vulture scientific name is uh, Cora gyps atratus. So her name is Cora, sort of an honor of um, black vultures. This is the black vulture is the only bird that I will let my kids come into the enclosure with. Um, he's uh, just a very, uh, I trust this bird um, a lot. The other birds are, I'm not, not, not safe to send my child in with. Um, other fears people have, you know, are they waiting for me to die? And no, tur turkey vultures uh, don't follow dying animals or people despite the movies. Turkey vultures seem to prefer stuff that has been dead for about a day. Um, they can smell it then and that they can kind of follow their nose to food. Um, you know, and they, people often say, well, you know, they look creepy, right? But beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Um, and, you know, bald is beautiful. Uh, if, you, if you imagine, you know, a, a, a golden eagle without feathers on its head, it will look very similar. <laughs> maybe worse, maybe not as cute as a vulture. Um, this too, I, I think this is um, also a lot, the root of a lot of our fears about vultures, right? Like that we see these Westerns with the, someone crawling through the desert, you know, and the vultures are circling, following, and we think, you know, here are these birds, uh, they're, I'm starving of thirst, they're just waiting, you know, they're waiting for me to die, they want to eat me. Um, but if, so if you ever find yourself in the desert, in this state, and you see vultures, just try to keep calm and carry on. <laughs> Ah, just my favorite. <laughs> okay, so this is this is the end of my presentation. And this here, this bird in this picture is Lou the turkey vulture um, at a program. Uh, just um, also Lou is the one who has the one eye um, who was hit by the vehicle. So I'm um, happy to answer questions. I don't know what the, the chat has been doing, but I can. Let's see, I can probably stop sharing the screen and now I should be able, and there's all your faces again. Uh, and I should be able to look at the chat, I think, and see what happened. Ah, as a kid, we used to lay still in the yard as long as possible, trying to get vultures to circle us. We were weird kids. No, no, I have done the very same thing. Not weird at all. Uh, Let's see, where else? Um, uh, is there a pecking order for where they are allowed uh, to perch in the roost? So I, I have, it's sort of anecdotal, I guess, but I have the roosts I have seen, it seems like the young birds often have more poop on them, uh, which makes me sort of think that the young birds are probably the ones that are sitting on the bottom. Uh, so maybe there is something of a pecking order. Um, it's not always the case, but uh, you can usually tell who sort of the bottom turkey vulture, the bottom vultures are in the in the roost because of they're being covered in poop, <laughs> which is probably not not a great experience. Um, and let's see here. Uh, this person says, David says, a cattle farmer told me once that she had lost a newborn calf to a flock of black vultures. Um, I think we talked, we probably talked about that a little bit, but yeah, I've heard, I've heard of that. Um, it can be really difficult to tell if a vulture uh, killed a calf, for example, 
or if the calf was stillborn and the vultures happened to be there because they are smart and they know where births happen in the field. And placenta um, is really easy to eat. Uh, there's no there's no hide to get through. It's really dense with nutrients. You know, it's kind of slippery and you know tasty, I guess. Uh, but it's it's something that um, a lot of uh, a lot of animals want to eat placenta. Um, I have never eaten placenta, but uh, I think that in a lot of the I've watched videos of black vultures and newborn calves, and uh, it seems in a lot of the videos I've seen, the birds seem to be trying to kind of get the placenta in a in kind of a frenzy. However, um, I mean, how would you know if you, you know, if I had cows and a cow gave birth and I and I came out to the field and there was a newborn with vultures eating it, um, you know, how would you, I guess it'd be really, unless you witnessed it happening, it would be difficult to know if the vultures killed it or if it was having trouble um, and, was killed. But if they do kill it, they have to, it's on the, it's something they do on the ground. Uh, they like, like, like walking up to it. It's not, it's not like they are carrying anything away. Um, if that makes sense. Ah, does Maverick have a favorite colored ball? He really likes the purple. The purple ball pit balls are his favorite. Um, and I, I am not sure I don't know why. I have no explanation for it at all. However, uh, I've seen videos of black vultures in the wild playing with like soccer balls and stuff like that that have been left on fields. Uh, and I've seen videos of black vultures at zoos playing with like balls that have been left in animal enclosures for not for the black vultures specifically, but for the zoo animals to play with. Um, I'm not entirely sure why. Black vultures also uh, well, if you go to the Everglades um, or some other places, there are signs that say like the black vultures will wreck your car uh, if you park here and they sometimes will give you a tarp to cover your car. Um, they kind of will sometimes pick at the uh, like the stuff that goes around your windows or your windshield wipers. Um, I've not heard a satisfactory reason really why they do this, but some theories that I've read is first that it's just playing and that black vultures are very active and investigate different objects. Another theory I've heard is that soy is used in a lot of uh, rubber as an ingredient and that perhaps it tastes, it seems like food because black vultures eat so many different kinds of kinds of things that maybe they, maybe they think it's food um, and it tastes like food perhaps. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, I don't, turkey vultures don't seem to do it in the same way. Um, as black vultures do. Uh, California condors, though I've read, also will engage in that sort of destructive behavior, especially if groups of young ones get together. Just kind of kind of fascinating. All right, let's see here. Ah, yes, the analogy of a French manicure as a way to remember black vultures with white wingtips. That's really good. That's good. And a French manicure is where you paint the tips of your nails white, right? Just like the black vulture wings. That's great. That's great. Uh, I have a pair of black vultures in an old falling down shed. Yep, they are back again now. Is there an organization who would like to see or tag them? I mean, I would like to see them. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know that our, you're probably a pretty far drive from where I am in Morgantown, West Virginia. And I don't think our, I'm not sure our permit covers Maryland or not, but uh, the, there are a couple different groups that might tag black vultures. Uh, the USDA in West Virginia is ta has tagged a lot of black vultures to try to figure out their movement, something about understanding how they move, like where do they migrate, how far do they wander, stuff like that. Um, Hawk Mountain in Pennsylvania puts tags on black vultures. Uh, um, I don't know other groups that do, um, but the babies are pretty fascinating. And if any of you, I can tell you sort of a, uh, I can give you, I mean, I, um, there are a lot of interesting stories of people who have black vultures on their properties, in their sheds, in their barns, and that they really get to know the birds and the birds seem to get to know the people also. Um, 
and maybe uh, less scared of people they see often around their nest site, um, which is kind of interesting also. I mean, black vultures, turkey vultures are a lot more secretive in a lot of ways. They tend to, you know, nest in places maybe a little bit, a little bit further out of the way. Uh, they don't, don't always roost right on um, rooftops like black vultures do. I mean, black vultures are, you know, a lot like people in a lot of ways. Uh, they are always kind of right, right near where a lot of people live. Um, they eat the stuff that we leave our trash out. They might eat it. Um, you know, they they're uh, they make use of human subsidies. They make use of the stuff that we kind of kind of leave. Um, all right. Do they pick peeling paints like they do rubber items? I'm not sure. I don't think I've heard of that before. Um, however, I can tell you that Maverick <laughs> investigates everything that, that I was in there with Maverick, the black vulture once, and I, I had sandals on and I got sort of a rock in my shoe, uh, in my sandal. And I took off my sandal to kind of brush the rock out. And he came over and ran over and grabbed my sandal, um, and sort of like ran around with it and was like picking it up and dropping it, picking it up and dropping it and like putting his little beak all over the buckles and all over the straps. Uh, I mean, he investigates nearly everything that we've given him. Uh, I mean, that he also, he's been with us for six years. So he also um, has never had a bad experience with anything that we've given him, um, which, which could have something to do with how enthusiastic he is about, what did they give me today? You know, what is it? It has food in it somewhere. You know, he gets uh, really excited about it. Um, have you ever been bit by a vulture? Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, it, it hurts. Um, but it's not, it's not as bad as getting bitten by, there are other things that hurt worse. I mean, a parrot or something hurts a lot worse, but I also, I have a blue crown conure, uh, you know, a small parrot, um, and her bites hurt worse than turkey vulture bites, but um, they definitely, they definitely bite. Uh, my husband was bitten right on his neck by a turkey vulture once, and, and it kind of, they kind of do this grabbing, twisting thing sometimes. So it hurts. Uh, are the Andean condors found in the snowy regions of the Andes? You know, I don't really know a whole lot about Andean condors. Um, I know that they are, I went to Colombia and they were not where I was. Um, I'm not sure, I wish I would love to see Andean condors at some point, um, but I'm not sure if they are in those high snowy peaks of the Andes or not. Um, but that same part of the world is the part of the world where Argentavis, that largest flying bird ever, um, lived. Uh, so it's on that, you know, it has to be very windy, you know, for, for huge birds like that to fly. Um, yes, black vultures are good for public, public health. They probably can eat COVID. Um, I mean, they can, they can eat pretty much anything. Uh, to most many vulture species, turkey and black vultures, I don't know if I mentioned this, in addition to their strong stomach acids, they have beneficial bacteria in their guts that can help them break down stuff that would make, uh, make other people very sick. And the, the uh, amount of bacteria that they have in their guts is enough to just you know, like on a, on any given day is enough to make humans very very sick too. There's two different types of flesh eating bacteria that live in a turkey vulture's gut. I'm not going to be able to remember the names of the bacteria right now, but they are, uh, um, you know, help the vulture break down everything that they eat. All right, and yeah, and yes, vultures are protected. Yeah, under the uh, Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Yep, just like every other, the same law that protects vultures now protects robins, um, you know, uh, everything else, hummingbirds. All right, let's see. I think we have, do we have new comments down here? Oh my gosh. Oh, thank you for laughing at me. <laughs> uh, uh, is there a pecking order for when carrion is eaten? Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, I would suspect I would suspect so, but I don't I don't know that for sh for certain. Interestingly, though, 
Uh, whereas turkey vultures, the babies leave the nest and they join up with the adults in their flocks and they kind of are all, uh, there's apparently there's not much evidence that young turkey vultures continue interacting with their families once they get to the communal roost. But there is evidence that black vultures will feed each other and feed their young uh, months after they have left the nest. Um, there are cases where black vultures will be around a carcass eating together and one will turn to the other one and feed it. Um, you know, when there are no, when there are no babies, their birds aren't babies anymore. You know, they've been out of the nest for a long time. Um, yeah, and some of the vultures that come to the farm have like white dust all over their backs. Yeah, it's def that's droppings. <laughs> that's the droppings from other birds. Yes, poor guys. <laughs> um, I have seen vultures uh, soaring or eagles soaring with vultures. Who is following who? That's a good question. Um, probably uh, eagles will also follow vultures, turkey vultures to, to carcasses. Um, however, it's possible that there's just really good wind in that location, um, you know, and the, and the really good wind is sort of what everybody wants to be. Everybody's using that same good wind. Um, but I have seen some interesting uh, like cameras that are set on, you know, looking at carcasses um, and there'll be, you know, 30 turkey vultures eating it. And then all of a sudden they all fly away and a bald eagle will land. Um, I mean, you know, certainly, you know, a group of a group of vultures at a carcass would attract the the attention of another, you know, larger scavenger like a bald eagle. Um, anyway, what is this question here? Black vultures, yes, displacing turkey vultures in southern Virginia. Um, you know, are they more aggressive? They're described as more aggressive um, black vultures, although uh, they do seem to be polite with each other while eating. Yes, black vultures often, uh, often, uh, and turkey vultures, I mean, they, they interact pretty regularly. Um, from what I know from talking to people who study, have studied vultures in the tropics, um, they have noticed that when the turkey vultures from the upper west, so the big, the biggest turkey vultures, the biggest subspecies is that upper western subspecies, uh, when those big birds from the north get to, you know, Venezuela, Colombia, they will often displace the tropical black vultures. So sort of the opposite thing happens um, when the big birds, they're just so much bigger. The northern turkey vultures are so much bigger than the black vultures that the black vultures can be as, you know, aggressive as they want. And it doesn't make too much of a difference. So, um, it's not, it's, that's not the case. It's definitely something you need. Well, all that makes it easy going in and out. It sure does. It makes all the difference in the world. Uh, Sorry, Katie, I just had to mute of some other people. <laughs> well, that's all right. Um, and I think that we're getting pretty much finished, right? Baldi, yeah, you know, like there's one last comment. Yeah. Yeah, learn to recognize yeah, regulars, pe regulars near the nest and not uh, kind of, yes, yeah. And so crows, I mean, crows do that too. Um, our vulture visitors patiently wait for our feral cats to finish eating. And sometimes the cats will wait for the vultures to eat together. The vultures are actually picky sometimes and wait for us to give them their favorite or preferred food. Yes, uh, I'm not surprised that that's, um, there, I, I watched, uh, I watched um, black vultures at the San Antonio Zoo sharing um, a food dish with the flamingos that were part of the exhibit. And they were all sort of standing around the, kind of standing around the, the in the, the feeding area, eating these pellets out of the, out of the food dish. And it was very orderly, um, you know, they weren't like attacking each other or anything. Uh, uh, the zoo, some of the zoo folks I talked to, I think were not too thrilled about the black vultures sort of all coming and hanging out um, in their exhibits and eating the food for the zoo animals. But it's, um, it's, it's interesting. And I've heard, I've heard other people say similar things that the birds come to visit them and they will sometimes, you know, seem to know Boris, the turkey vulture that um, lives at ACCA. 
uh, the person who found her in his yard, she um, came to his yard every day for about a month and he fed her steak at the same time every day. Um, and, and then when, when uh, he, we were, when it seemed like she was, she could fly a little bit, not well enough to, to uh, survive or, or go very far, but enough to sort of get run away. Um, turkey vultures can actually be very hard to catch, um, even if they can't fly that well. Um, but we knew the bird needed help. Uh, the guy, the only thing she was eating was what this man was feeding her. Um, and he would call her, he would go out to his yard and say, Boris, Boris, come down, come on, Boris, come get your breakfast, Boris. And uh, she would kind of come down from the low branches of a pine tree and walk across the yard and eat her steak. Um, and then when we went to kind of capture her, we just walked up to her and put a, put a net on her. And it was, <laughs> um, so she was, you know, she was very well fed for a while. Well, thank you so very much for being so generous with your time and all of your wonderful knowledge and information, Katie. We, I've learned so much from you. Well, thank you, thank for, you so much. Thank you for listening to me and for having me. Yeah, no, I'm so excited now. I want to get your book. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I did have a Black Vulture family in my shed for several years, and um, it, it got pretty stinky by late summer. Okay. I've decided I had to get rid of the the entrance to that. <laughs> and um, so hopefully they'll find someplace else next year. They, they will even just nest right on the ground. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too worried about them. <laughs> Given the numbers I see, I, I didn't think it would really hurt them very much. But yeah, I saw the chicks and oh, they're actually kind of cute. They really are cute. Yeah. And they... And they tried to hide from me and, oh, it was just so cute. They, it was like, you know, little kids, you know, if I can't see you, you can't see me kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, and they just, kind of, they just kind of walk around like, uh, yep, <laughs> they're very cute. So anyway, I, I'm so grateful you came and talked to us and um, took so much time to answer everyone's questions. Thanks again. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah, and uh Hope we can see everyone in real. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Yes, post COVID. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe you can come talk to us about the cerulean warblers. Yes, those are small, cute, and declining. You know, as opposed to. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Yeah, I I still have yet to see one. So. Hmm. Maybe I'll find get another life bird one day. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Thank you all for coming to our presentation. Thank you. Thank you.